<laughs> That's great. So uh, thanks so much. Hopefully this is the only week where we're doing this. Next week, everything's wrapped up and we're able to meet upstairs once again. Awesome. I wanted to tell you a couple things. One, um, I, I wanted, I'm going to put this on the table over there later. You may or may not know this, but we had um, a good opportunity to be generous to a school that's in my neighborhood. Uh, at the end of the year, we gave uh, 20 gift cards out to the parents. Each one of the parents, or we gave 20 gift cards out to 20 parents. Um, and each one of the parents wrote a thank you note to us. I think it'd be really cool for you to read it. The school that's in my neighborhood is, um, struggles quite a bit financially, and so they were hugely blessed by your generosity. Thank you so much for doing that. We've done a few other things with that school. They have been enormously grateful for that. They've, they've really, really, really loved it. So thank you for being part of that. That was really cool. We have an, uh, an, uh, a cool thing that we're doing this morning. We are going to welcome in some new members. So cool. We have a, like, several dozen people are already members. A few people, I think maybe eight or so people are going to become members today, which is exciting. We're, we had to shift it around because we're meeting outside. And so if you're going to become a new member today, which means you've gone through the class with me, we talked things through, we've had a follow-up conversation about it, we both agreed that you want to become a member. Um, if that's you, great. Please, would you stand up? Is that all right? A few of you are here. New members? Much, which is really fun. So stay standing. So one of the things that we do, so we, we like to do membership. Membership here is just a way of basically of saying, I'm committed to this community of people. I want this to be my church home, my church family. I want to be responsible to these people, and I want these people to be responsible for me. If I'm going through something, I want them to help me out. If they're going through something, I want to help them out. Right? And so we, it, it's obviously very um, uncool right now in a lot of uh, churches to do this because it feels like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of commitment. But we're hoping that it's just a benefit in a way of essentially saying, I'm going to grow in my faith and I'm really committed to growing my faith. So what we do as the last step of becoming a member is we, we make a declaration together. We, we say a, a public statement of, I want to become a member. And then I will say a public statement in response that I'm responsible for you and I'm going to pray for you and love you and care for you and stuff like that. Sound good? Now the way that we like to do this is we like to ask all people who are currently members to also stand up with you and we'll make the declaration together because essentially the declaration is we're in this together. And so we're all going to say it at the same time. Are you able to read that? Yeah. Great. Awesome. I'm going to turn my mic off and I'm still saying it with you, okay? I'm part of this. Father, today we thank you for sending us to this family of members. We submit to the authority of these elders as they submit to the Lordship of Jesus and embrace the people of this church as brothers and sisters in Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we intend to be faithful members of this local body of God. Serving with our talents, loving with our time, and giving of our treasure, so that this body may be built up as each part does its work. May our membership advance the spread of the gospel and make new disciples, the strengthening of your church, and the glory of your kingdom. And uh, would you stay standing? I'm going to say something to you. Father, today I acknowledge Jesus as the chief shepherd of this flock, which has been purchased by his own blood, and know that one day I give an account to him and receive my reward from him according to how I shepherd this flock. By the power of the Holy Spirit who called me to this noble task, I intend to govern the church with diligence, serve her with humility, shepherd her with care, and lead her with courage. I intend to lead through example, through prayer, and in faithfulness to scripture. May my leadership advance the spread of the gospel, the making of disciples, the strengthening of your church, and the glory of your name. It's my commitment to you. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, thank you so much that you have inspired people to commit to your church, to commit to this body. That they have taken a step of discipleship that will allow them to help and encourage and support and challenge uh, other people in their faith and also will help them to grow as well. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that this church 
would be a real benefit and a real benef- real blessing to everyone who's a member. I pray, God, that we would live up to the noble calling of being your sons and daughters. So I ask you by the power of the Spirit that the things that we have just declared, you would give us strength to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's so fun. All right. We are going to spend a minute now in the Bible. So if you have a Bible, you can go to John chapter 3. And for we have a few new people. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. This, uh, this time, when I'm teaching, is interactive. So if you have a question, feel free to raise it. Even though we're outside, you can still raise your hands. We can still interact, okay? So please... Ask something. I tried to prepare a shorter sermon. By God's grace, that was that was wise because I think it's your attention spans outside are much shorter. You know, uh, some bugs gonna come and get in your hair and it's gonna go crazy like it used to all the time. Ken, you know what I'm talking about in your beard. Um, and uh, so feel free. You know, if you got a question, if you disagree, whatever, feel free to say. All right. Let me let me before we get into this, just pray for um, God's word as we teach it. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, just for revealing yourself to us through Jesus and through the Bible. We ask that the meditations of our heart, the words of our lips, would be pleasing in your sight. You are the Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. We pray in your name. Amen. All right. Um, This morning, we're going to talk a little bit about doubt and what to do with doubt. Any of you ever struggled with a season of doubt or wrestling with your faith. Great. A few of you have. So I have massively in my life. I've had several seasons that were months long, even years long, where I had significant doubt. And Kimmy, my wife, is the same. In fact, when we got together, um, she was in a season of doubt and I was in a season of strength. And one of the reasons she liked me is because I was able to help her through a season of doubt, which was great and served her. Amen. Now, it served her really well until like a year later when it flipped and I got into doubt, and she was in strength, and I needed her to, to help me out through it. And I feel like, you know, everyone I talk to all around is in seasons of doubts kind of constantly. They're either currently in one right now, or they have been, or they're going to be in a, seri- in a s- series of doubt or something like that. And I just, you know, what do you do about that? And I think one of the reasons, one of the causes of doubt right now seems to be that we're just exposed to so many ideas. There's constantly a barrage with all these different thoughts about what may be true, how to explain this or that. And it used to be the case that if you grew up in a place, you only met people who agreed with you. You only knew people who agreed with you. So if you grew up in America in the 1700s, you just you either knew Christians who wanted to be Christians or you knew people who knew Jesus and just didn't want them. Or if you grew up in India, you only knew Hindus and or not, they were one or the other, whatever it happened to be, and that has just shifted, and so now there's a crisis of faith, not just happening in Christianity, sometimes you you might think that we're the only ones having people doubt their faith, but it's happening in all religions around the world for that same reason, because people are coming face to face with different ideas, and they're like, I don't know if what I grew up with works anymore, I don't know if I believe that anymore. And so the question that I have is, you know, what do you do? When you have a season of doubt or you struggle and you wrestle with your faith, what do you do? How do you get out of it? And the the story that we're going to read this morning is written in a very similar situation to that. That John's gospel, the one we're reading, we're in John chapter 3 this morning. John's gospel is written into a culture where people were starting to struggle with their faith for the first time. Because things had gotten really, really culturally diverse. So John wrote from Ephesus. Ephesus was a big metropolis. There were religions kind of all over the place, like every religion you could imagine. And for the first time in human history, you would run into people from Africa, people from Asia, people from Europe, all while living in the Middle East. And it was like, what, what do I do about this? And they're bringing their new ideas, and you're struggling. And all day long, people are coming out of temples, going into temples, and having parades, and they're just being confronted by it, and there's a lot of doubt going on. And so what do you do during that season when, when you're struggling? And I, I think what John does to respond to that is the same thing that we should do, and that is, he says, think long and hard about who Jesus is. If you're struggling with your faith, think about who Jesus is. Don't think about religion, and do you think religion is great or not great? 
Don't think about a church or a leader or anything like that. Don't think about those things first. The first thing you do is you think about who Jesus is and you ask yourself, do I think that Jesus is this? Is Jesus really who he says he is? And the more you think about him and the greater that you see who he is, the stronger I believe your faith will become. And that's, I think, what we're going to see in this story. That God does us a favor by having Jesus show up and reveal how awesome he is and how unique he is and how faith-building it is to know who he really is. So that's what's going on in the story. So you look in John chapter 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside And Jesus remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. So you can picture the scene. You're in Israel, the first century Israel. You're in the wilderness. There's a little river there. Jesus has a following of people. John the Baptist has a following of people. People are going over to be baptized by Jesus. Other people are going over to John the Baptist to be baptized by him. And so John's kind of losing a little bit of his following as they go over to Jesus. Now, verse 25. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. They came to John. They said to him, Rabbi. He who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Look, he's baptizing. And everyone's going to him. Jealous? Now, that's, that's what he's trying to do, right? It, it appears what's going on is that this John the Baptist is losing a lot of followers, and they're heading over towards Jesus. And a Jewish guy comes up, and he's like, hey, what's going on, buddy? You're losing your popularity. Everyone's walking over to Jesus. Are you hurt by that? you pained by that? And now he's also, this Jewish person is not necessarily a follower of Jesus. He's not really a follower of John. He represents a third option, which would be the Jewish religious way. And essentially he's poking a little bit like, hey, your way doesn't look right, John. Maybe my way is the right way. Maybe his way is the right way. And there's a little bit of confusion going on. And I think that we have a similar situation in our culture right now where you look at it and you're like, okay, so is John right? I thought he was for a long time. Or maybe the Jewish way was right. I mean, that's what I grew up in. Or maybe Jesus is right. He's the new one that just came along. I just heard about him. What do I do? I'm faced with an options that are out there. And I would suggest that you pay attention to what John does and follow his track. So, look at verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears, he rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So what's the essence of John's message? Step number one in verse, in verse 27, a person can't receive even one thing. And John says, you need to get back to square one. You need to go back to the very first step. You can't receive even a single true thing about God, or at least the foundational true thing about God, unless God reveals it to you. And what is that foundational true thing that John had been trying to tell them? I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Savior. I'm not the one who's going to fix your problems. I'm not the healer. I'm not the redeemer. I'm not it. Stop looking at me. Start looking at Jesus. Jesus is the one to pay attention to. If you've got spiritual questions and you've got doubts and you've got confusion, don't look at some human that's out there. Look at Jesus, realizing that no human's your savior. No person's your redeemer. No person's your healer. No person's your problem solver. Jesus is. And John's saying, look, the very first thing I'm trying to tell you is that I'm not the man in that way. I'm not the one who's going to be able to help you out and fix all your problems like that. Jesus is. I'm not the Christ. Jesus is. You yourselves bear me witness, verse 28, that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. My job is to point you to Jesus. And what was Jesus' job? The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. 
So in this story, they're, they're reflecting back some Old Testament pictures. In the Old Testament picture, God presented himself as a groom. And his people were the bride, and they were going to get married to each other. And so now in this moment, John is watching his followers walk away from him and go over to Jesus. And who does he see walking away from him? The bride. He sees the bride leaving him and going to Jesus. And so he rejoices, and he's like, I'm not trying to attract an audience to myself. I'm not trying to get people to attach themselves to me forever. I don't want a fan base that sticks with me until the day I die. I'm always trying to deflect people away from me to Jesus. And so I, I'm like the best man at a wedding where I'm like, if the bride's hanging out and talking to me, I only want her doing that for so long. Eventually I'm going to be like, hey, your husband's over there. Go, like, get away from me. This is awkward. Get over there. Leave, And then when the bride starts walking over, he's like, yes. He's not sad like, oh, man, that's my girl. That'd be messed up. Instead, he's like, good. You're finally going where you're supposed to go, which is you're supposed to go over to Jesus. The, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears the, the groom rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. He's saying, I'm happy now. Like, the thing I was made to do, I got to do. And so from now on, for the rest of this wedding, I need to shrink. And Jesus needs to become the bigger deal. At the wedding that we're talking about, the groom takes center stage, not the best man. Okay. So John is pointing out three things, or a few different things, but at least three things that are in here that Jesus is superior in, or a reason why um, people should be looking to Jesus. So, number one, he's the Messiah. We, we talked about that for a second. What's this conversation about? So, Jesus is better at doing something in verse 25. What do you hear in verse 25 that Jesus is better at doing? I remember what it was like preaching outside. You all got very distracted and lethargic and sleepy. I mean, wake you up. What's Jesus better doing it? At doing? Purifying. Purifying. Right. This is an argument about purification. Okay. This is an argument about purification. A Jewish person and John the Baptist are arguing about it. Why are they arguing about purification? It's because every culture throughout human history has always had rules about what's polite. When you're going to go meet someone, you wash your hands. You take your shoes off before you come inside. And so you do it partially for hygiene, partially for hygiene, partially just to like love the person, right? But every culture did the same thing with God as well. That they would wash their hands before they did something with God, or they would cleanse their feet, or they'd wash their face, or they'd change their clothes, or they'd do a sacrifice, or whatever. They did all these different purifying things when they were going to go meet God. And John the Baptist is out baptizing people in the water as a purification, saying, hey, this is the way to prepare yourself to meet God. And the Jewish guy's like, no, 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 we've got our own way. Our way is that you wash your hands over here and you make this sacrifice over here. And essentially what John's way was saying was, your way doesn't work anymore. So you got to try something else, which is really insulting to say to someone, isn't it? He eventually died. He was killed for saying stuff like this, right? Hey, your way is wrong. And so they're debating which way of purification is the right way. And now coming into this conversation, entering into this conversation is Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He baptizes as well, which means he offers his own version of purification. But what kind of baptism does Jesus do? One more time, Ben, really hard. Spirit baptism. Thank you. That's great. It's just really interesting because in this verse it says Jesus was baptizing, but in the next chapter it's going to say Jesus didn't actually baptize himself. He wasn't the one who baptized people. And what the author is trying to communicate to us is whenever Jesus baptized anyone, he always baptized and only baptized them with the Holy Spirit. He cleansed them by giving them the Holy Spirit. How different is that? You can prep yourself to get ready to meet God by washing your hands, washing your face, even washing your whole body in baptism. But you're going to get dirty right away. And you're not really going to be that clean, right? Whereas if you get baptized by the Spirit, you get washed on the inside, and you are prepped on the inside to really meet and know God. 
the, the analogy that I have is um, I do a, a good amount of premarital counseling. And I always like to ask the couples, yeah, are you getting ready? And they're always like, yeah, we're totally getting ready. Got the wedding venue, got the DJ, it's amazing. We got our photographer, we got our flowers taken care of. And it's awesome, I got my dress, and the guy's like, I got my suit, and it's amazing, we're so stoked on this. And I'm like, uh-huh. And are you getting ready for the marriage? And they're always like, no, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> well, what do we do there, you know? And I always want to say, like, so many people nowadays will spend hours and hours and hours finding the right DJ and finding the right dress and finding the right venue and all that kind of stuff and not do any premarital counseling, not read any books, and not really get their hearts ready. And what they're doing is they're putting all their eggs into the day basket instead of the lifetime that follows basket. <laughs> the relationship that actually matters basket. Now, I'm not some spoil sport. I hope you find a great dress. I hope you get a wonderful DJ. And I hope the pictures turn out really good. But the really big deal is the marriage, right? Because you could have a phenomenal day and have a terrible marriage, or you could have a terrible day and a wonderful marriage. And what we really want to focus on is the marriage itself. And similarly with Jesus, he's saying, look, someone like John the Baptist or someone like this Jewish person can wash you on the outside. And you might be clean for a day, but you're not really prepped for the marriage or prepped for the relationship that you can have with God. Whereas Jesus, what he can do is cleanse you from the inside and transform you so that you would love God and you would know God. And the second thing that he's saying is, is just building off of that. And he's saying, and Jesus can marry you. Right? The whole thing about a bride and a bridegroom is him being like, I'm the groom. Don't you want to be married to me? And essentially what he's pointing out is, look, John can help you like, get ceremonially clean over here. And this, this Jewish person with the religion of Judaism, they can help you be a good religious person. But what Jesus can do is get you into a relationship with God that neither of these people are able to offer to you. And, that, and I would say the same is true of so many religions and philosophies that are out there is that they're focusing on an experience or focusing on religion. But what they can't offer to you is a knowledge of God, a relationship with Jesus that will last a lifetime. And now when, when we think of marriage, we primarily think of romance or something like that. And so for some of us, like most of the guys in the room, we're like, that's weird. I'm not really sure I want to marry Jesus. It seems a little odd. But marriage is much bigger than just romance. It was, romance was a small part of marriage back in the day. What else does marriage communicate? What is Jesus trying to say about the quality of relationship that you can have with God? Or the benefits of the relationship that you can have with God? Protection. So a marriage provides you with protection. And that protection could be physical. You might, you might marry someone who can take care of you in that way. Or protect you financially. Because they've got a stability of a good job. Or they might protect you emotionally. Because they talk things through with you. What else does a marriage provide? A good, amazing, godly marriage. What else would it provide? Loyalty. Someone is going to stick things through with you. They're going to stay by your side. They're not going to give up on you. It's not going to come and go. Whereas like a spiritual experience can come and go, but it doesn't guarantee itself to be with you. Whereas in a marriage, God's saying, I'm with you from day one to the last day and after that also. What else does a good quality marriage provide you? Covenant. A, a covenant commitment, which is we are tied in together where God's not just saying, I've got great feelings for you, but who knows, maybe they're going to leave tomorrow. But he's like, I'm committed to you, whether your feelings come and go, my posture towards you is always that I'm going to help. My posture towards you is always that I'm committed to you. My posture towards you is always going to do what's best for you to build you up in your faith so that we can become more like one another. And one of the things that's cool about covenant is that the closer that you get to each other, the more like each other you become. Right? And I've made this joke before, and I love it. I love it when older couples dress the same. You know, they buy the same fabric from Joann's, and then the guy makes a shirt, and the girl makes a dress, and you're like, that is awesome. I love that. But then there's something really cool about that, because the husband and wife are becoming like each other. In a very similar sense, we become like God. The closer we get to him, we become like him. We get transformed like him. 
And what John's going to say later in this gospel is, eventually you're going to get to the point where whatever you ask, I'll give it to you. And what he means is, you're going to be so changed by our relationship that you're going to start to want what I want, to like what I like, and your prayers are going to be things that I would have been praying if I were in your shoes. And of course, I'm going to say yes. That's what a marriage offers to you. Jesus is saying, look, I can give you that. I can offer you something like a marriage. All right. For that reason, John says, look, I, I got to kind of fade out. Like, I got to get into the background. This is not going to be about me anymore. This has to be really about Jesus. And, and, and the, the next thing is that if you are struggling in your faith and kind of wondering, how can I know that Jesus really is true? The, the next paragraph gives us some answers. So in verse 31, this is John, the gospel writer's kind of summary. He says in verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth. He speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet, no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. This is amazing. And essentially, what he's saying is, you want to know why you can trust Jesus? It's because of where he's from. Amen. He's from heaven. The one who's from above is above everything. The one who's from heaven is above everything. And when he comes, he speaks from what he's seen and heard. And so I, I talked about that last week. It's like Jesus grew up hearing the truth nonstop, so to speak. Like, it, I mean, lived for all of eternity in God's presence. And then he shows up communicating what he knows, what he's seen and heard in the Father's presence. He now makes known to you, of course you can trust him. When I was, when I was in seminary, I took a Greek class. We had to take a lot of those. And I'm um, not very good at Greek. But um, some of the people were. And the professor I had was a real legit expert and a little intimidating, we'll say the least. Uh, to say the least. So the guy would just like stare you down and you would, you know, cower before him and all that. One of the things that you had to do in the class is that uh, you would go around, uh, he would go to student to student, you had to, you had to read one sentence in Greek out loud. Whatever. And, uh, and everyone hated that part of the class. They hated the other parts of the class too, but they hated that one the most. <laughs> and, uh, and what was fun about that class is that we had a guy from Greece in the class. Guy was maybe 30, just moved from Greece, didn't speak English as well as he spoke Greek. It was awesome. Because every time someone would say something in Greek, they would kind of like look at the professor and then look back at the student and be like, was I right? And it was so sweet because you have an expert and you have a native in the room. And who do you trust more? And at the beginning of the class, we all knew the guy's reputation was the expert, but eventually none of us really looked at him. And eventually the expert, the, the professor, would say things and they'd be like, right? I was like, that's right. Humble that guy out there. This is great. It was so fun. And what essentially Jesus is doing for us is he's the native in the room. And he's saying, you may have experts out there. You've got gurus and you've got spiritual teachers. You've got all these people who started religions and stuff like that. And they're kind of like an expert in the sense that they've come up with something and they've got this reputation. But Jesus is the native. He's from heaven. Other people might think they know what they're talking about. Where are they from? Chances are they're from Irvine, you know, or something like that. And you're like, eh, whatever, you know, I don't know if I trust you. You're not from heaven. And if you're looking for someone who's an authority about spiritual things, it's a good thing to know where they're from. And if they're from earth, well, that's one mark against them that's pretty significant because Jesus is from heaven. So he knows what he's talking about. And you can trust that. And the second thing that he says after that kind of goes even deeper. Verse 35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Who's your dad? And he's basically saying, you've got all these religions out there. You've got lots of philosophies. You've got lots of people on TikTok trying to be experts and like whatever telling you, you should do this, you should try this. And I think they would say, well, where are you from? If you're from heaven, great, then I can listen to that, but you're not, so... That's against you. But secondly, who's your dad? If your dad's not God, then I don't want to listen to you quite as much as I want to listen to Jesus. 
whose dad is God. And so he's told him everything. It's just, he, the picture is supposed to be like father and son speaking to each other for an eternity, the son receiving everything that the father is and being able to embody who the father is in front of your eyes so that everything he says and everything he does is an absolutely perfect reflection of who God himself is. Is that trustworthy? He knows what he's talking about. You have lots of ideas, lots of religions, lots of spiritualities, lots of experts, but you only have one person who's ever walked this earth who is from heaven and is the son of God. Listen to him. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. He's just giving you an option. And he's essentially saying there's a fork in the road and you do have to make a decision because if if, the, if, you make, if, you, if you make a decision towards Jesus, you're heading towards life. But if you make a decision away from Jesus, well, you're headed towards death and you're headed towards judgment. And he's essentially saying the decision's kind of already been made in a way that you're headed in the wrong direction. What you need to do is get off that path, start heading in the right direction. You need to start heading towards Jesus. You are born, we're all born into ignorance, we're all born into sin, we're all born into shame, we're all born into just not knowing basically anything about God and needing to turn to Jesus and say, reveal God to me, I want to know him. And then as you learn about God, you start making decisions, you start obeying what he says, start living out what he says, start trusting what he says, then you see he's the full, absolute revelation of God and I'm finding life as I know him. This is the way that John will describe it. This is eternal life that you know Jesus. This is eternal life that you know Jesus, the, the only true God. That's the point that John, that uh, Jesus is going to be taking us on in a couple of chapters. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Does anyone have any questions? We had a lot fewer questions when we met outside. One reason we had to move inside. We got a lot chatting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The first one was Christ, that he is the Messiah. Yeah, the second one was purification. The third one is relationship, so the marriage portion. Anyone else? Yeah. Is there a connection with this part and Nicodemus's story? Perfect. Yeah, so that's perfect. I, I meant to say something like that. Um, so when John's talking about his own baptism, and the Jewish person's probably talking about his own ritual washings, in the context of Jesus talking about baptism, we're all supposed to remember the interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus in the first part of this chapter, where Jesus says, you must be born of water and the Spirit. You remember what we talked about then? It's a reference to the Old Testament, where he's talking about having a brand new life given to you, which water is a symbol of life. The spirit is the one who gives life. And now what he's saying is you have to be born again into this. So when the spirit comes in your life, it's you're born again into a new life. It's also a cleansing for you because you're starting new. So that's the connection. Great. Anyone else? Um, I'll just summarize a couple things. So if you are a person or you have a friend or a colleague who is struggling in their faith or struggling to trust Jesus, the thing that I would encourage you to do is take them to Jesus. Don't take them to religion and whether or not religion is always right. Don't take them to some leader because leaders will always disappoint you. Take them to Jesus and say, hey, let's start here. Let's talk about who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the purifier. He's the redeemer. He's the one who can help you. He's the one who offers you relationship. Focus all of your attention there and let the rest of your faith build out upon that foundation rather than starting with religion or starting with some other idea and trying to back your way into Jesus. If you're sharing your faith with someone, that's the way to start. Start with who Jesus is. Don't get caught up in all the other questions that people have Start with who Jesus is and build up faith from there. Another thing that I just kind of felt impressed by as we were, as we were thinking about this, or as I was praying for you this week, was that some of us 
feel a need for purification. That we feel like we're kind of either dirty right now or can consistently feeling dirty. I'd just like to say that when you're coming for a purification, you don't have to do things to yourself to get purified. Right? You don't like wash your hands a ton or get obsessive about cleanliness. What you're asking is, Jesus, come. Wash me. Now, one of the things that Jesus does is he calls you born again, which means you are positionally before God. You stand clean. You have been washed. You have been purified. You have been sanctified through the blood of Jesus. But another thing that Jesus can do for you is he can give you an experience of feeling clean again. He can wash you again. He can refresh you. He can give you the spirit, like another experience of the spirit. You know, we're like, oh, okay, thank you. Kind of reviving my faith. And I would just encourage you to pray in those ways. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have washed me through your blood. I ask that you'd help apply that blood to my my emotions again. Apply that blood to my life again so that I just, I know that I'm clean in your sight in a deep way. Yeah, Joel. Uh, For someone who is doubting, is there like a book or a chapter that you'd recommend that could help be like a starting point to look at Jesus? Um, Yeah, so if if you're doubting, if you're doubting your faith, is there a book or a chapter? I have a book shelf for that, if you'd like to look at the shelf. Um, There's a lot of a lot of really good ones. It depends on the nature of your question. Um, It depends on what you're doubting. So what I would honestly would do is I would just meditate on the Bible, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, Sorry. Talk with me, and I'll hear what your doubt is, and then we can talk it through. Joel, you're struggling right now. (laughs) Um, I know for some people, like for me, if I meditate on the Gospel of Luke, that it really helps me out a lot. I feel like it's a very kind of current gospel. It talks about a lot of issues that people currently have, a lot of debates and questions that people have. And seeing Jesus, the way he's revealed in the gospel, look, I think is very faith-building for a lot of people. So that would be where I'd start. I'd start in Luke chapter 4. For me. Anyone else? We're going to respond. Um, We're going to respond just in prayer, and we're going to respond in singing as well. If you feel like, yeah, I need prayer for purification, or I need prayer for my faith to be strengthened and to grow, we're going to have people over here where Motorcycle Matt is standing, sitting. We're going to have people over here where someone else on our prayer team is going to be standing. I would encourage you to go over and receive prayer. And... Don't leave here without doing that. I would also encourage, if you're with people that you know and love and you need prayer, pray for each other. We've done a ton of that in the last um, last year. It's been really encouraging. So ask people who are around you. You don't show up to church just to be passive and to listen. You show up to minister to. You show up to serve and to be served by the people who are around you. And so I just encourage you to ask people who are around you for prayer if you need it. I'm gonna, I'll open this up and then we'll respond with some things. Would you stand with me? We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the great purifier, the cleanser. You wash us clean. We thank you that the blood that you poured out on the cross cleanses us. We thank you that the Holy Spirit who comes into our life cleanses us. And we thank you, Lord, that that's a permanent thing. The Spirit transforms us and changes us. And I want to ask you, Lord Jesus, that you once again would give us increasing faith and an awareness of what you have done for us. What you've done for us on the cross, what you've done for us through the resurrection. Build our faith to trust who you are, to appreciate it, to love it, to believe it. We ask that you would exalt yourself, Lord. We need to decrease. We want to humble ourselves before you and even before other people. We must decrease. You must increase. We want our eyes, to, to uh, people's eyes to turn away from us and be deflected to you. That when they see us, the best thing that they see about us is you. Pray that would be true for each one of us, and I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship.